Greetings, everyone. Um, thank you so much for uh, being here. Um, uh, my name is Eric Hayes. I'm the artistic director of the uh, Eugene O'Neill Foundation, and um, and we're here uh, to talk. I, I I see this as a kind of a special, um, unusual first time discussion opportunity, and and that's based on the idea um, that. Um, this is the first, there, there are people, there are people in today's, wow, there's lots of dinging around here right now. Um, there are lots of um, uh, people who have <laughs> got the doorbell. Um, uh, there are people here who have read the play. There are people here who have read and written about the play. There are people here who have, um, you know, really invested in the role that this play plays in Eugene O'Neill's biography. Um, you know, uh, what it says about him as a, as a person and as an artist and his work. Um, there are probably even a, a random person here who thought they'd learn something about best practices of blowtorches, but that's the wrong welded group. Um, but um, this is the first time you've also got a chance to um, talk about it as a piece of art that that that, that has been experienced, uh, you know, a, a couple people from the, for instance, I know a couple people in our audience um, saw it in New Ross and Danville, um, and then everyone else, um, your your opportunity to kind of just size it up and think about um, the experience of it as a piece of art um, and what that says or how that informs um, all your other thoughts about the play. Um, and so um, I'm really interested in um, just kind of going through the journey to, to initially to go through the journey of the of, of the, uh, pretty, the production team, um, primarily uh, myself as the director and the actors and, and Beth Weinstra, our, um, our dramaturg, and share maybe some thoughts um, about our initial read of the play. Uh, what it was like. Um, this play had three incarnations, as I mentioned before, in January 2022. It was mounted for the first time uh, at the Museum of the San Ramon Valley in Danville. Then in October of 2022, it was remounted and in some ways needed to be reimagined for the St. Michael's Theater in New Ross. And then after that, in November and December, it was uh, we gathered at Eugene O'Neill's barn and and shot it uh, to create a film uh, filmed version of the play. And I know for me, the play kept evolving through each iteration. And I'm sure different things were going through the actors' minds during that time. Uh, at, and I'd love to hear anything they have to say about those things. Um, then we'd also, if you guys have uh, any. Um, questions or comments, please put them in the chat. Um, and uh, we also have, I think, some prompts uh, uh, about welded in the chat as well. Um, but uh, I would like to first, um, and I expect this whole program would be about an hour. That's just my guess, best guess. Um, uh, but anyway, I'd like to I'd like to turn things over to Beth Weinster, our dramaturg, uh, for her to briefly say a few things about her experience. Beth. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Eric, and thank you to the foundation for putting on this um, event. And um, go Celtics! Okay, so there's my Boston pride. There. <laughs> That's for Steve Bloom, really. But uh, uh, so I, I will start by saying that I had to ask Eric this week about how did we get to this play that I I had forgotten part of the journey and. Eric reminded me that we were in a discussion group with um, Ron Quirk, and some of you were in on that discussion as well, in which we had read Welded and we had come and to discuss the play. And um, I'm sure it's of no surprise, given my interest in marriage and O'Neill, that I come to this play very keenly interested in um, this couple in the play at the five-year mark of their marriage and what expectations they had before getting married and what how they should be acting now. And so I saw it as a play very much about expectations and what a couple hoped for and what's maybe falling short. So that's what I was presenting at this group discussion. And Eric was really interested in the lighting, I remember, and the lighting, the stage directions about 
lighting. So after that, we started to talk offline and found, right, Eric, that our interests were not apart, that ideas about roles and expectations and the way one behaves in a marriage kind of coincided with your interest in how these characters appear on stage and the lighting cues in the script and things that you wanted to explore. So that is kind of how it began. And um, I will also say that Eric and I had worked um, the year before on Beyond the Horizon, and we found a kind of nice through line about um, marriage and couples and getting into romantic relationships, that there were similarities in, in both of these plays that we were excited to explore. So um, I, I just was dazzled by the production in January. That was the production I saw at the museum. And I know Eric and, and the actors will probably talk about um, some of the things that happened in that production, particularly the ending and how Eric had kind of reimagined this couple at the end of the play. So I hope that that comes up in, in your comments, Eric. But uh, it was it was a joy to see the film over the weekend and to see the growth and to see that those interests in lighting and roles that kind of were at the start of the of the journey grow into something really compelling and nuanced in the film. So uh, I think I'll pause for right now on those and and jump in later. Okay, thank you, thank you, Beth. I I, I would like to say on, on my side of that experience, and and I think Ron just joined us, so I'm glad he's maybe here. But uh, yeah, th that discussion um, got me thinking about, for the first time, I just started musing out loud in front of other people, like, how would I do this play? And when Beth mentioned that line about, I only play a role you created for me or something like that from the I play. I only act a part you've created. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, that, really, that really kind of like uh, intrigued me. And I thought, oh, that's very theatrical. And and along with the lighting, um, I'm 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 a little more interested than I was previously. Um, I would like to say, as my my initial take on the play, um, is that I've read it uh, a few times over the years, and um, I, I've always been enchanted by the notion of the ego, the the auras of egotism, the the idea that the two main characters are in spotlights. So that 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 was interesting. That was theatrical. So I was always dri drawn to that. Um, but I could not reconcile the text. I just could not uh, get my head around the text and how to make the text work. And that was initially, you know, one of my big challenges that I finally decided to try to uh, head face on or, you know, face head on, I should say, um, uh, with this time with Beth, with, with her help, I decided, okay, let's, let's look at the text. And maybe with that idea of playing roles, I was, I was open, open to it in a way that I hadn't been previously. I'd also like to say that, you know, there are only, uh, as many of you know, there are only two other productions prior to ours that I know of, which was the 1924 original production, and then the 1981 Jose Quintero production. And what I don't understand about and in reading about them, I don't understand um, the choice to go realistically. Um, to me, uh, the biggest key to maybe being able to face that language that otherwise I couldn't quite uh, get my head around was to think that that there's uh, something stylistic going on. There's something symbolic going on. Um, this is this is a play about uh, a, a psychological space and an emotional space and and uh, and being literal about things um, didn't make much sense to me and I wasn't drawn to create anything that was literal um, and I found that that kept evolving and I'll talk about this more but later but over the year I just kept getting more abstract in my thinking about the play um, but anyway um we have uh, Terrence Smith and we have D uh, Adrian Dean and we have Craig Eichner and we have Bonnie Deshawn, our four actors from Welded. And I would love to encourage uh, uh, you guys, uh, any of you that have any thoughts about your initial uh, read of the script, your, your character or the play overall, I would love to just hear an actor's perspective um, about the play when you first read it, if you can recall that. We, we were working on this for a very long time, so I understand that you, it's, it might be hard to recollect some of those things, but if you can re recall anything, I'd love to hear it. I know for me, when you when you first uh, 
talked about the the play itself. You kind of pitched it as it's two people and the aura of egotism. And and so while I was reading it, the vision was a black box of just two spotlights and that was it. And um, so as as it came out and the and the venues have changed, uh, the the museum was a little bit different and the new rosters are different. And, and I think all the lighting and the physical movement, all this kind of change have to, grew naturally, but it also had to had to change to adapt to the new space we were working with as well. And all your as you're seeing, oh, that's a that's a neat aspect. What happened? Let's explore that avenue as we were um, unfolding and unpeeling the, the the script to see what else was in it. Uh, Craig, could, could you you played John? Could could you did you relate to John uh, up front from the start? Could you see where that character was going or what you could do with it? The nice sad guy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's kind of the on the outside trying to trying to push himself into a, a Dean's or, or Nellie's sphere of influence. It's like, yeah, I have my own life, but I feel more alive when I'm with her. When I'm when her light is shining on me, I feel more alive. I feel better, uh, and I want to be as close to her light as I can. Nice, thank you. Um, any other actor? Yes, Bonnie. Yeah, I was going to say when I first read the play, I I always think of this when I the plays that you do aren't they're not always the most common. Uh, sometimes you do, but I don't ever understand why it's not been produced in all this time. So long, a hundred years, you know, since somebody's well, and then one other production. Um, I think it's the the relationship still very relatable, you know, they're the interest level, the the neediness, the I depend on you, you depend on, you know, you're taking, you're, I'm only alive when, you know, you're only alive when I'm there, all that kind of, uh, you know, the big relationship that, that I'm not involved in. I mean, my character has a real, you know, important role and I never really saw it as the, as the real, you know, <laughs> sexual character, you know, the sexual temptation. It was more the, I was always gonna be the one that, you know, get his, his thoughts back lined up. Uh, so, but I think it's a beautiful play, and I think the the relationship issues are still very relatable. Oh, thank you, thank you, um, yeah, uh, Bonnie. I, I would like to just add you 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 made me think about how there's just such a difference between what you read on a page and what you can do with it as an actor, and um, that's a, a big difference that I think sometimes gets forgotten, especially with a play that doesn't get produced, so you don't actually well, have anybody, right, right. Well, right. and I don't think he was really looking for what it looked like at the beginning. What he was really looking for was not really, you know, a, a night of cheating. You know, the actual act. I, I don't really believe that. So, right. Okay. Thank you. It's a good um, thing he didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Dean or, or Terrence, do you have anything uh, about your initial take on the on the play? When yes. You read yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, my initial impression as I first read this piece was that it just gave me massive melodrama hallmark black and white vibes it's something that you would see <laughs> on uh nick at night uh during their classical hour but uh i mean there's just such a christmas t a crispness to the dialogue and the language and you know it's just interesting especially with the relationship between uh nelly and michael you know and especially with relationships you know uh five years ago their relationship was very much new it was exciting they were discovering new things about each other and they were just in love with this idea of being in love but you know five years later and you're just trying to keep the imagery of the honeymoon alive and you know as you know you have one person who's on the end of the spectrum where you know it's that honeymoon idea that creates sparks within the relationship and then you have this other end of the spectrum where they're really ready to just ground back to reality so you know like as fun as this is and as fun as being on this ride can be with you you know you know uh can we stop the act and be people just for a couple minutes out of the day and you know uh it's very you know i'm 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 always interested in the it's, it's very Shakespearean, especially when you get to the point of now these people who have been in love for five years now go out into the to the world to make each other jealous by committing the most atrocious act that they can think of, which would be having an affair. I mean, really just playing into the, the theme of envy and what envy makes one person do in terms of 
hurting a romantic partner. So, you know, it's 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 always been a it's been an interesting thing, just kind of figuring out the layers of both of these characters, and just you know, when you think of John and the woman, you know how they play pivotal roles and kind of changing the trajectory of where these two couple of uh, these two people try to go in terms of destroying their relationship yeah thank you thank you uh dean do you have anything to offer uh, about uh, or share about the initial thoughts of the play um that i think i definitely agreed with dan dan's comment that these and I kind of, I kind of feel this way when I first read some of O'Neill's plays, that it's almost, it's almost too. The, the, ma the main characters are usually feeling more transparent than is possible to portray. Um, just too almost open book. Sometimes um, I think I've felt the word melodramatic come up, and that's an, uh, an off a comment I've heard now a few times. <laughs> about an initial read of an O'Neill play, by fellow actors at least. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and um, I mean, it, it took me maybe too long to realize that uh, that Bonnie and, and Craig's characters, uh, Woman and John, were there to kind of remind, remind the audience or about what it means to be more grounded, maybe. <laughs> Um, or or more human. I agree with that characterization. Um, and I think Eric, you pretty early on leaned into that during our rehearsals, um, that they were meant to kind of uh, sh shake us back into reality, if if possible, which was supposed to eventually be possible for us to to feel, but maybe not initially. All right. Thank, thank you, Dean. Actually, that's a really good segue for for when we worked uh, when we first worked on the play in late December and then uh, in uh, January for our, uh, the production at the museum. Um, I was still going into that rehearsal process thinking that I was going to try to do the uh, the beams of light, the the two auras around uh, uh, you know Michael and Eleanor, um, and and of course you know I I, I there was some nice symbolism in the idea that they were so full of themselves that the other characters could only be illuminated by the the you know the the light that they you know the meager light that they could get from the edge of these two people's uh, egos but but because um for two reasons one one um I couldn't keep you guys separated enough physically, um, you know, in, in the blocking to make those two individual spotlights read as individual spotlights. It would just, it just was too muddy. Um, and secondarily, I found, as you just said, Dean, the, the John and the woman were far more um, fleshed out than, than that strategy of just being illuminated by the, the part of, you know, someone else's ego would allow. Um, I didn't want to rob the audience of of um, being able to fully relate to John and woman since they played, as you said, uh, such a pivotal role and and in both cases were so so much more grounded. Um, um, some of the thoughts I just wanted to share about the for me with the initial January production um, rehearsal and performance of it was, you know, I, I, I tried initially to introduce the idea um, of an audience. Um, like the 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 spotlights. I didn't have I didn't have a budget to have spotlight operators, so I knew I was going to get whoever was off stage was going to be uh, you know holding a light on the actors on stage. And initially, I thought I don't know if I ever shared these things with you guys, but maybe I did. Initially, I thought of uh, you guys, uh, the, whoever was holding the light, as tech operators, like you were techies. So you were going to be playing like you know the roadies holding the lights for the what's going on on stage. Then I thought of you guys as actors in the wings who kind of were jealously quipping and commenting on the actors on stage because you weren't on stage. And, and neither of those quite worked um, in my mind as I rolled through them. And then I, and somehow it, it came to me like that this whole play was about a theatrical couple and why not the, the operators of the lights be actual members of the audience like they were patrons. And and so that became our kind of conceit in 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 um, in January. Um, uh, I'd also wanted to say that it, uh, important to the initial production in January was the use of the stairs. 
um, because I was leaning into the symbolism of the play. I wanted the stairs to, to represent sort of Michael's ideals and the challenge that uh, Eleanor had living up to those ideals. And so that in, in a sense, they could represent ideals and fears simultaneously. And I also knew that the stairs would physically not go to anywhere. And I kind of just embraced that as a symbol uh, that there was a limitation to this. That didn't mean you weren't going to try to go up the stairs, but I thought, okay, stairs as symbol became a really important thing for me in this, in this play. Also specifically um, the word wife became a really important thing because uh, you know, as, as Eleanor has these very strong, there's these very pivotal moments, both in, in, in act one and act three, where we're at heading up the stairs, heading up into the what I would say is a world dominated by Michael's uh, vision and ideals. The word wife somehow gets in there. And, and, and per many conversations I've had with Beth, we were very interested in exploring how that, 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 um, that would resonate as a series of expectations um, for Eleanor that maybe she couldn't abide by, uh, a, a fear that uh, she would be subsumed into something and lose her identity as, as, as a fellow artist or, or as an individual. Um, and, and it's, I, you know, I, I, you know, one of the things whenever you're working on a play, you think, okay, why is this day different than other days? And somehow I kind of feel like somehow Eleanor on this day just can't, she, up to this point, she's been, able to be swept up the stairs and just been fine with it. But somehow this day, that word wife triggers and something is going to be different this day. And, you know, obviously that's the basis for creating a, a, a drama with some conflict. Um, and also in our first production in January, I was very interested in the, the idea of playing roles, how that was about assumptions and then how it would, it would break down. You know, um, I kind of saw each scene. Oh, I, let me just put it this way. I think of the play as four scenes. And in scene one, uh, Michael and Eleanor are going to play lovers and it breaks down. Then in scene two, you know, Eleanor and John are going to play lovers and it breaks down. And then in scene three, uh, Michael uh, and, and woman are going to play lovers slash prostitute, John, however you want to frame it. And that breaks down. And, and in scene four or act three, I like the idea that that's an improv, that that's why I had the two actors, uh, Michael and Eleanor, race to each other, embrace each other, and then figure out what their roles were because they, weren't gonna, they didn't go into the scene knowing the script. And I guess that became a big motif for me is the idea that uh, people had social scripts and, and they thought each scene was going to go a certain way. And obviously it didn't uh, until the last scene where they just had to hash it out, you know, as an improv and, and um, anyway. Um, and then also just lastly about the first production, I just say the shadows. Uh, I, I was mostly thinking of the shadows as um, we, uh, as, as symbols of division between Michael and Eleanor, how they, uh, how they would feel uh, separated from each other or isolated from each other. Um, but anyway, uh, 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 actors, do, do you have any anything to share about your January experience, about that iteration of the play, and and you know, uh, you know, whatever resonated with you, or or anything to share, or anything that went wrong that you never told the director? I don't know. I'm fine with that too. Uh, but any 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 of you, can you tell anything about the, the the first version of the play in January in the museum? what that was like, how that worked, what didn't work for you. I'm, I'm open to any of that at this point. Anything? Yeah, I mean, the element that we did play with uh, the actors who weren't on stage playing the patrons of watching the show, I mean, it kind of just ties back into the aspect of the place in somewhat being a melodrama where, you know, at the most pivotal moments you have the, the that audience interaction, you know, say if you were sitting at, a, at home watching a soap opera like, dynasty or something like that where you just see like like dynamics in the relationship or you know infidelity or betrayal or just like things at a more pivotal moment where you just kind of see that 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 audience excitement which really does kind of you know in itself you know as we discuss in the process the audience also serving as the the fourth the the fifth character of the play where you know just when something pivotal happens it's just like you know like wait, what did he say? Like, shh, I'm I'm trying to listen. It's getting really good. Like, like seriously, they're about to they're about to break up, or he's about to run off and have an affair, or it it really just kind of just plays into the archetype of the 
of the soap opera melodrama, especially when you're feeding off the energies of the characters unfolding. Yeah, it got a little more um, realistic when we stopped doing that. I mean, it seemed like our involvement made it a little, maybe like you said, melodrama, you know, we're watching, we're watching with you. It, there was kind of kibitzing and fun kind of thing, but once we dropped that, um, and I don't have an opinion, yes or no on it, but once we dropped it, it, the whole thing became a lot more serious, like a, like, you know, a real story unfolding and there, there was no more jab poking or any kind of thing like that, you know, hmm. but both sides fine. But yeah, that I kind of, it was a while ago, but I do remember how, I mean, that was, that was fun. For sure. We were all involved in all the scenes all the time. Yeah. Great. Great. Uh, Craig or Dean, any, anything from January's production that you'd like to share? I, I think uh, kind of what Bonnie and Terrence both said, it was, it felt lighter, I guess. And it could be also that we weren't as in depth, you know, it, 10 months more later, 10 months later into it more. Yeah. You're more, more into it than before, but uh, it was, jovial hey it was it was a different camaraderie and and i don't know there was no i don't want to say competition but there was just it was just light and and um fun I, I, not that the other ones weren't fun but it was uh mm -hmm. not uh, the the serious stuff we went to new ross and all of a sudden it became we, we tried to change up with the not to segue to the next spot but the 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 dance of the uh the scene changes and, and all those things that kind of evolve. Um, it just, I think as we got more into it, we realized we got deeper and deeper and realized, oh, there's more layers. Let's explore those layers as far as we're going on. And um, this comes a little bit more heavier, a little bit more serious play than, than in maybe a, your initial first read thought it would be. Yeah. Thanks. I'll, 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 I'll take that segue and uh, answer that question while, while doing that. Um, I don't think I knew really who Eleanor was until uh, during the January performance. I think it took me uh, many months <laughs> to 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 figure out um, where her where the it felt like a more sharp cusp of an arc really happened, which I think happened in the the John Nellie scene. And I've mentioned this before, but I, I think in January I was just trying to, I was trying to put together a show very quickly with a, with with as much uh, much work and honesty as possible. But I don't think I I, I got her until the um, second the second rendition. Thanks. Thank Thank you, Dean. Eric, I think you should also mention, this is to Dean's point too, that usually your January productions are script in hand and because your actors had to hold the lights, these four, right, memorized in what, like three or four days, something, two days. Okay, so sorry, two days. Two, week, two weeks, yeah. Two weeks, oh, okay, two weeks, even still remarkable, Dean. But um, that's usually not what happens in those January production so it was really a, a feat of of these actors and um I also wanted to just quickly mention with the convention of the audience members I think it also gave your the 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 real audience who was there permission to laugh and permission to not you know, that this isn't straight realism or that maybe recognizing our own lofty romantic language that we use with our partners that we would never want anyone to hear about. But all of that, I think, came through by having those audience, having our actors as our audience members in that January production. Yeah, actually, that reminds me that that I I had, uh, Beth, I, I had that exact thought, which was that I, it was easy to listen to this intimate conversation and criticize it. And I, I, I remember at that one point thinking, I'd like, I, if I could, I would love to get the audience to kind of recognize that you probably say just as ridiculous things in your own private life. You just don't have an audience for it. So you, you know, you, you know, you're not judged the same way. Um, I also, on that note though, I, I would like to say that I think part of the convention of the audience for me was my a reflection of my lack of imagination i couldn't quite figure out how to make the heightened language not a little bit silly so i think i added the audience to kind of cover that 
Um, cause I, I, my, my thinking was if we, someone within the context of the play found something a little silly, like the, uh, like the planted audience member who makes a little comment, um, then the audience wouldn't tune out. They would stay with us and go, oh, okay. The production knows that was a little bit over the top. So it's okay. I can still stay with this as opposed to my concern was that the audience, um, couldn't stay with us when we got too lofty. Um, in our in our in our rhetoric uh, about our coupleness and our love and all that, um, but obviously that proved uh, to be uh, not the case. Um, and I was happy that actually it's a perfect segue to go into October, which is when we went to New Ross. I knew I had to drop the audience convention because of the space. Um, we were going from a intimate, like fifty seat space in Danville at the museum to this the, the a 300 seat space with a, an orchestra pit. And there was no way that I could get the uh, actors to hold lights on the other actors and, and, and in any way convincingly seem like they were part of the audience. It would just be kind of a distraction visually to have these figures on stage, you know, in some ways almost getting in, in, in the way of the action to make sure the light was on people. Um, and so I knew that we'd have to sort of drop that. Um, but what was what was really nice, I think the two things I'd like to say about um, uh, New Ross and, and, and that large space uh, was one, um, knowing that we didn't have that type of, we, didn't, we weren't going to use spotlights anymore. We did a little bit for the internal monologue stuff. We did sort of a, a set spotlight for that, for that sequence. But, but, um, but chose instead to go with sort of a backlighting strategy. So we traded shadows for silhouettes. Um, and, and actually decided that would make a big thing out of having silhouettes, uh, in particular during the transitions between scenes. Um, and that brings up probably the biggest thing for me, and I'm really curious from the actor's perspective how this affected them if it did, but when our sound designer uh, gave me, I, 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 I did not have a sound design for January. I just did repetitions of Pachelbel's canon. <laughs> um, and, 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 uh, in, in, for new Ross, we actually had a designed sound and all of a sudden playing that sound when we were rehearsing, preparing for Ireland, everything, that music really informed me. Everything seemed dance oriented and it seemed lyrical and poetic in a way that it uh, didn't before. And knowing that we were going to go to a large space, I kind of wanted to fill the space with movement. And so that's why all our transitions uh, had, you know, had the sequence where we would see the, the characters in silhouetted form um, either being themselves or being something symbolic, uh, like the, the people on the street or something like that. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, actors, did, did, did uh, New Ross, I mean, Dean, you've already shared that New Ross, something kind of made more sense to you in New Ross. Um, I'm curious, guys, if, if you could say anything or share anything about uh, the play in New Ross how it changed for you, whether the music played a role in how you, uh, you know, how you felt or, or how you played things. It was all the same. They're all good. Um, um, Craig, go I'm going. <laughs> no, uh, I think that um, I was probably a bigger fail than anyone of the, uh, the interludes, uh, you know, I, I need I need more time than a day to or a couple of days to to learn to dance and be graceful. So I feel like I maybe let people down on that end of it, um, and let down your your vision perhaps of it. Uh, the music I thought was great, and I like I like the uh, the the thought of us moving the 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 time pass the passages where we kind of rushed around the stage kind of busily. I mean, I thought it. I don't know how it looked to the audience, but I thought it looked like we, you know, we knew what we, it was, it was showing what we wanted them to show, but the dancing part was a little difficult for me. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, but I get, I get where you were going, you know, right. and we needed to fill the time. And I thought moving the furniture with that background of um, being lyrical was, was, you know, nice. So, but yeah, it was not my favorite part because <laughs> I think I let everybody down on that one. No, no. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie. Craig. Craig. Um, uh, for new, uh, I think, like I said, we had eight, eight, nine months to dig into the script more and the Zoom rehearsals and all the things we got into, and then getting to New Ross, we didn't have the flashlights, we didn't have 
the other stuff we were doing, we were just focusing on our part. And I think it really concentrated the the energies and the focus up. No, I need to deal with just with Nelly. That is my focus on here. And it was a great um, opportunity, especially the space and the movement and to to really dig into who John was and what their relationship was. And and the the dancing in between it it kind of allowed it to flow, I think, in a, a nice way. Then the flashlights, flashlights work great in the smaller space. But as you said, in a bigger space, having um, having that distraction out of the way and just letting us do do what we want to do or do what we need to do on stage. Um, it felt good. It felt really good. Yeah. I know how it looked, but it felt really good. So <laughs> Terrence or Dean, do you have anything about New Ross? I mean, I'd say if anything, that uh, the musicality and the physical movement that we had been doing in a way served as a interesting little sewing piece where it kind of uh, sewn the scenes together in a way where you left a huge moment at the end of the first scene where Michael bursts out of the door and Nellie's left remaining. It kind of just showed where, you know, you had a moment of Nellie just kind of having a brief moment of realizing that, you know, I, I'm free. I, I don't need you. I'm free. And then just there was, if I remember correctly, there was this almost lightness of, you know, a certain revelation up until the point where now you're in the scene with John and, you know, the the, the music of, you know, it's kind of a separation where now you're kind of in a newer reality until these characters are introduced in this scene following the closure of, you know, John, uh, you know, realizing that this is going to be the nature of Nellie and her his relationship. And this almost air of light air of, you know, accepting that this is just what it's going to be. And then going into the next scene, which, you know, the music was kind of disjointed. It was staccato. It was a lot of like, bah, 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 you know, in Michael's own chaos of trying to find this Shakespearean figure to satisfy his ideal of a lustful vengeance upon his wife. And even towards the end of that scene, another kind of, you know, the revelation that the woman ends up endowing Michael with, uh, you know, almost a new lease on life where they're at the end of that. I think that it started off lightness and then it was kind of like the musical transition where it, it gave an era of just like two lost souls just wandering in the void until you get to the final scene where they come back together. So it, I think it definitely did aid and kind of like, you know, maybe it's giving a little essence of the, the in-betweens before you actually got to the meat of the scenes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Dean, Dean, anything to share about New Ross? Since you kind of obviously made some discoveries there. About New Ross or about the music? About, about, about uh, Eleanor and music or any anything, anything from the New Ross time. Um, Um, yes. <laughs> uh, I think I, what I was able to kind of get, um, thank you, Craig, from our rehearsals was, um, I mean, I knew that Nellie was in honeymoon love at the beginning and was trying to hold on to that almost desperately <laughs> and also terrified of it and that she had to end up transformed in some way but still but in that transformation still choosing Michael I didn't know how to get there until one rehearsal in New Ross probably thanks to the kind of chaoticness of we got to basically learn a whole new show <laughs> um in three days three days yeah about three days yeah and uh in one rehearsal, I think I was just, I was like, forget it. I'm just going to play. It's going to come out. We're going to dance and then we're going to loosen up. And then, and then Craig, Craig delivered some one line differently, or I heard it differently. And it was, it was the line where um, John says, I, I don't hate you. And then pause. What was it, Craig? But I should. I should hate you. <laughs> I forgot the line already. But it, it's it, no, you're, you're mute. You're on mute, so I can't hear anything you're saying. 
uh, but it was something like you I, say uh, do you hate me and i said you know i should hate you you realize this is the third that. time you've broke my heart or yeah mm -hmm. and you delivered it differently or i heard it differently and all of a sudden i thought oh okay well this is this is this is going to be the moment where she she realizes some kind of the the harm that's that's some that she has she does some of the time um by not choosing to voice herself. Um, and then I went with it. <laughs> but it, it was it was it was new Ross. And then I and then I had a, a nice arc, which is what I always need and did not did not get to in time for the January production. Mm. And I actually I think the, the music would have helped me at least loosen up during the rehearsals to get there. Yeah, actually, yep, yeah, but perfect. Thank you, Dean. Actually, that that makes that reminds me that in rehearsal, Terrence, I want to give you a shout out. A lot of the dance, the feeling of dance and lyricism, probably came from one of the first times I played one of the songs, and you made your entrance with the suitcase, and you did this little like pirouette with it, and I said, "Oh, okay, okay, we could get really stylized about this, and why don't we see if we can find other places in the in the play, or at least the transitions." to have sort of a stylized movement uh, that kind of uh, feeds into the, the, the feeling of the music. So thank you, Terrence. Um, okay, let me, let me just transition to the last uh, phase of this before uh, we, we open this up to anything that someone wants to uh, ask or comment on. Just the, the, the we came back from Ireland uh, and in November and December uh, crammed around holidays um, and shout out to you guys for being there like, the day before New Year's Eve, uh, in the cold and the rain. Um, and you can talk about the weather there if you want. I'm fine. Um, we went, we went to the barn, Eugene O'Neill's barn, and we, uh, shot the film over a series of about, uh, it was, it was, uh, we shot a few days in November and then we came back in December, right at the end of the year and shot the rest. Um, I want to say when we got to the barn, by this point, I totally, as a director, totally saw the play in terms of an emotional space and a psychological space, and it was not a physical space at all. Like, where the people were didn't matter, you know? It, and in fact, that kind of informed um, a moment that, that we bypassed in the earlier iterations. The, the, the um, Dean, you'll remember this, you know, the door opens inward. Um, that, that we never had any doors. So I just somehow never thought, you know, I did kind of had thrown that line away. And then finally in the, in, you know, in, in new Ross, and then again, uh, in the barn, uh, it really seemed to make sense. It was like, there's nowhere else to go. I mean, like, I, like the answer isn't somewhere out there. She, you know, she, by, by the end of the play, she's already tried to go out there, didn't find the answer. So the answer is something within herself. And so, again, it just kind of reinforced the idea that it was not about a physical world. It was about an emotional you know, world or a world shaped by emotions and psychology. Um, I'd also say that in the barn, um, I uh, was re got really interested in the shadows again. Um, we put we put the white drops on all the walls and and I, I became more interested in seeing the shadows and the interplay of the shadows. And for me, um, I was always thinking more shadows better uh, because I and I couldn't always understand and still to this moment, I can't tell you what each shadow means, but I know that it's evocative and it kind of played into my vision for. Uh, these characters and all of us are, have multiple sides. We have, there's multiple versions of us and, and we play different roles with each other. And so even two people in a room is really a multitude um, of possibilities. And I just wanted to kind of reflect that as much as possible in the interplay between uh, sort of live action characters and their shadow and their shadow selves. Uh, and that's what I went for in the barn. Um, but anyway, uh, 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 actors, any, anything about the barn, including the circumstances of what it felt like to be in the barn at that time of year, I'm, I'm, I'm good with just, can you just share with our audience anything about, uh, what it was like to make the film in the barn, uh, for you? Very cold. <laughs> Thank you. Very cold. Weather was always a factor. It was either stuffy, freezing, rainy, icy, 
You can hear the coyotes howling in the background. So there were a whole bunch of interesting elements, especially that occurred during the filming process, whether or not it just be a helicopter or an airplane flying overhead or uh, just the critters and the varmints outside causing up a ruckus. So, you know, that's just the, the wonders of filming a piece versus, you know, when it's live, you just incorporate whatever the elements give you. But, you know, when you're trying to get that perfect take, you know, you either have to wait till the elements subside or, you know, just seize an opportunity when you can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anything? I think the, the difference with the, um, the the stage version, which and the 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 filming of it, which is, you know, you obviously when you're doing the show, it's it's a beginning to end. You have a ten minute, you have a fifteen minute scene. This was, you do it. Okay, now let's retake it. Let's just redo these three lines. Go. Let's do those three lines again from this angle. There was no. It was hard to mentally do the continuity because you're really only doing little lines here and there. And then it was Eric's work to to push it all together and make it look like a real scene. So as an actor wise, it was hard to, okay, turn it on now and turn it off. And now let's go to page 92. Okay, great. And then jump on that. So um, that was an interesting process. To, it, was, it was exciting, but it was, it was great to see you in the final product, like how it was all put together. But also we were not always in the same spot. Um, that we had always, re you know, performed it because you might need to get a shot differently or somebody was in the shot or the shadow was in the shot. And we also returned to people off stage using flashlights. So that like full time, that was mostly what, you know, what we did when we weren't on, we mm -hmm. were holding the flashlight to create some sort of shadows, go back to the shadows for the film. So yeah. most was pretty effective, but you know, that was a trial and error kind of thing too. So again, pretty cold. <laughs> so yeah, that's Man, been just... and all the sounds like, like uh, Terrence said, you know, anytime there was a, sh hold on, there's a wind, there's a, you know, there's a plane, there's a, yeah. So, so it worked, we did it, but yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and just to give a little more clarification, it's not like when we shot certain scenes that, you know, it was a, a day or two in between or even a week. There were some intervals where it was almost over a month where we had to break because, uh, for one, I was doing another show, so that had consistent conflicts or, you know, it's, it's just, you know, maintaining the same continuity in terms of the storytelling, the drive, the moment before that occurred before a previous scene and, you know, trying to build upon what you already had somewhat created or lived with within such like little snippets of time and then taking a huge kind of break in the midst of all that and to, you know, try to reestablish the intention of the drive that you had left behind that month ago and pick it right back up where you left off. It's definitely a challenge, but you know, when you're working with professionals, it just makes it a little more easier. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's, that's great guys. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I think, um, I think we're at that point where I, I um, uh, where we could just, uh, uh, Beth, have you have you identified uh, some yeah, some questions or comments for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I will start with one here. Um, it asks, do you think that O'Neill saw the husband's character's idealism as a fatal flaw? Might it be the result of the idealization of womanhood in O'Neill's time? So I, I I will start by saying yeah, yeah start with the yes and yes. part. <laughs> uh, I, I I think this plays very much dealing with the second part of that question of um, what women are were supposed to do that there is an idealized version of woman as wife and that. Um, all the things that are happening perhaps in courtship and like what Dean said in that um, pre-marriage or that honeymoon stage are supposed to stay forever and ever. And that, especially as women, we're supposed to feel that passion and romance and, you know, yes for our husbands at any given time. Um, and it, and in fact, it, it doesn't work that way. And so I, I think this play of the many things it's doing is playing with some of um, those expectations 
and the kinds of things that women particularly had to had to shoulder um, when, when they became wives. Yeah, um, you know, actually, one one thing I'd like to say about is I, I I I think in the spirit of the woman having to do more work, and I don't know, you know, I think this is kind of uh, something that's happened uh, in many generations. Um, in this play, I, I I thought it was interesting. Both characters, uh, both Michael and and Eleanor, change, but I think it's a different kind of change. It's almost like Michael is allowed to trade one sort of religious uh, idealist idyllic. Uh, idyllic kind of mania for another one you know he he actually gets to he, he it's almost like because he's in many ways at the end of the play although he's learned some things he's now taken the new information and resynthesized it into his new great vision for everything <laughs> um and 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 I think with the Eleanor character, she has much more of an internal journey, uh, or at least it seems like a more nuanced like um, change or under, under a different understanding about herself. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not sure if, uh, Michael's mod modality seems similar to me at the end, but but uh, um, I think of Eleanor. Eleanor's ready to go back into the relationship. Um, but I think she has her eyes open in a different way. And, and I think it's more, there's more agency in it. It's more like, okay, Michael likes to go off on these wonderful uh, jags about the great utopian life of ours, but I'm going to choose to be with him. I want to be with him as opposed to, I didn't know if I had a choice. Wow. I think now at the end, she does make a choice. Like I'm going to stay, but I'm going to stay for reasons that I, I, I more deeply understand than I did previously. Mm -hmm. that's that's my take but um terence or dean any any anything about that ideal as the the deal about idealism and expectations yeah i mean as you say while you know both michael and eleanor go on this huge journey where there is at least in terms for michael a certain level of change and a new understanding where it seems like he does kind of revert back into you know the norm that he was more accustomed to at the beginning in comparison toward you know whatever revelation that him and the woman had shared in scene three and coming into this i feel that you know it, it's a revelation and more of an understanding that you know even if our relationship might seem like there are certain things that don't feel appropriate to the status quo that I'm used to, that's okay. And we can continue to love and then we can fight. And that's a reflection of our passionate love for each other. And, you know, he, he dies back into the, the metaphor, which he essentially speaks 90% of the time in the entirety of this whole play, where I, there, there's a there's a willingness to grow, but I don't think he's completely conscious of how much like genuine work needs to be done within the relationship for it to maintain any solid ground. But you know, it 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 is implied that there is a start to something new, and hopefully that new can come to an understanding that you know Eleanor, Eleanor is more than just a an ideal or trade or archetype she is her own human being with her own wants feelings desires and nuances so hopefully you know in the future michael could listen a little bit more right right dean i think from from nelly's perspective i think she she fell in love with some element of michael's idealism and I think that stays through the end. So I'm I'm not sure to Diana's question. I'm not sure if 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 Nellie's perspective would agree that there's a fatal flaw there. I, I I think just based off of our take on this play, that um, where that Nellie had to come to get to a point where she brought to the marriage somebody first herself first um, and that transforms how she sees michael's idealism or, or maybe reminds her in, in a way uh, of something beautiful about it yeah i i i would, I would say in the spirit of what you guys were just talking about that the the way i chose to stage the end of the play 
the idea that that uh, you know that that uh, going up the stairs again, uh, and then um, Eleanor comes back down off the stairs, and and um, it was important for me to have this the, the idea that um, that Eleanor still like she, she just wanted to change some of the terms, you know, and I like, I like, I like the symbolism of coming, come down off of those old ideals, come down to the the floor, not because this is where you're going to now be, uh, you know, um, under my influence, but, but, but the ground floor is where it's level and it's equal. And, you know, as you say, the last line, we love, it's like, we, we, you know, it's like, a a a, a, a an attempt to uh, start a new understanding of the equality in the relationship, at least, at least how that's how I saw the ending. So uh, Beth, anything else? Yeah, and that's actually a good segue. Um, uh, I mean, I'll go. So David Palmer asked um, at the end of act two, scene one, Eleanor has a realization about her love for Michael um, quote, my love for him is my own, not his, that he can never possess. It is my own. It is my life. Is Eleanor realizing here that her experience of the world is something she creates, not something forced on her solely by the external world? Is there a link here to O'Neill? O'Neill's much later plays, Iceman Huey. In Iceman, the characters live most comfortably in their own pipe dreams. In Huey, Erie and Charlie struggle to construct stories of who each other are that will enable them to find ways to engage is welded the beginning of O'Neill's understanding that we live in our own self-created narratives, an idea he will uh, not develop more fully until his Dow House plays. So great question, David, as always. Uh, I, I'll just add the first part of your question reminds me, um, of the fact that yes, that her own experience of the world, something that she creates her own individualism, her, um, is, is actually interestingly enough, something that the critics, um, in the original production really pounced on. Um, there was a lot written in theater reviews, kind of like, who does this woman think she is? She, she should have let all kinds of individualism ideas and ideas about her own goals, her own dreams behind. She's been married for five years. So those thoughts should have kind of gone away by now, which I think is an interesting commentary on the social context of this play. Um, but as far as the second part of it and getting into the Dow House plays, Eric, probably that's for you or or others. Um. Remind, remind me the second half of it. I was so engaged here. David, do you want to? Hey, David, hey, David you're there. So what is the Right, yeah. Um, actually, this sort of arose. I've, I've been struggling with, with Xander's book. So maybe Xander wants to chime in at some point. His <laughs> magnum opus. Because I think his real point there is there's a huge change in, in O'Neill at Tau House mm -hmm. in the way he views the human condition. And I guess what my, my question really was, and I'll throw this out to the actors because they had to live this experience in creating these roles. Um, is there a way in which in, what we see in Welded, especially in, in Eleanor's character, is someone who begins to own her own life by understanding the world? My experience of the world is something I create. Mm -hmm. um, where I think originally coming out of the Greeks, um, O'Neill might have felt the tragedy is about people being acted on solely by forces outside them. And he had to sort of get over that overriding Greek vision. And I think he comes to a new vision um, at Dow House. And perhaps that's one of the underlying themes in, uh, in Xander's book, I guess, is where that question was coming from. Um. I, I I got I mean I can I can chime in one way and in, in with the Dow House plays I do think I do think there's a great emphasis on on coping I, I think that's that's a that's a good one one of the good ways to frame it um, the care I, the, I I sometimes kind of um, uh, uh, characterize it as madness you know like in the earlier plays people kill themselves to change their reality and in the lighter plays they find uh something that it may may be akin to madness but at least it's going to work for them you know they they create their own mental state to deal with their circumstances and in some ways i see a parallel with eleanor in this play in that she has an internal journey that she realizes that the answers aren't outside of herself she's going to have to you know make some kind of internal adjustment 
to make things make sense or work or work better. Um, and in that way, I think it is very much in keeping with what he does years later um, at Dow House, where it's, it is much more of an internal journey and uh, to find some place that you can live with or at least survive with, mm-hmm. you know, uh, in the worst circumstances. Dean, do you have anything about, not, not about the whole, o, o, uh, uh, all of O'Neill, but just uh, about Eleanor um, and her, her internal uh, creating her own reality or world um, idea? Yeah, I, you know, I think I think it was said perfectly uh, by David <laughs> in terms of how I feel um, about about that. That was a very hard um, section to to figure out how to perform um, within a momentum that kept seemed to be stalling until I figured out what part was more important um, in that, that John scene again. <laughs> um, and it's funny, you mentioned Greek because I was thinking there's also something very still Greek in in not only in Nelly in the way she ends the play, but also I think in, in the sense of how Eric um, created the ending in that there's still an element of ideal. Uh, there's still an element of, we're gonna reach for something um, in a different way together uh, and maybe because now there's more of of her um in that picture uh, at the very end that, that i'm thinking of eric set up in it, uh, as a frame yeah I, i'd actually even say about the, the very ending too that i just want to make the point that i think both characters make a choice at the end i mean eleanor goes down and says come to me but it's also a choice that uh and a sign of growth and or change that michael comes down to, to where she is and meets her on 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 the on the level plane um uh together i think that that uh, at least that's what what i was seeing was or going for was the idea that they both have their their moments of um coming together and maybe creating something new at least the potential for it you know as difficult as it might be so uh beth anything else yeah i actually i I was not good on my moderating here but dave king can you come on in and just add what you wanted to add i hope i'm not hi dave (laughs) hi hello Um, so i'm sheepish about this because i didn't see the production until the film Mm -hmm. and i was very happy to see the film because it allowed me to think about the play again but there was a moment you know before that, when I thought, I'll be glad never to think about this play again. (laughs) And the background of this is I spent years writing a book about Agnes Bolton, who was the wife of Eugene O'Neill at the time when he wrote the play. And the wheels were coming off the marriage at that time. And so, of course, I had to deal with this play in writing that book. And this play is so triggering to me. (laughs) In some ways, I, I felt that it was such a um, abusive play in a certain you know way that I kind of filter through sort of the language of nowadays. But um, but I I think it's a very very uh, revealing play about the sort of undevelopment of O'Neill as a as a married man and as a man who understood something about marriage. Uh, and I think he was trying to work out things about that, but he was caught in, uh, you know, of course, his, he's still, um, you know, a, a rabid alcoholic at this point. And, you know, there's so many things that are problematic about his character at this time. And, uh, you know, just jumping ahead, I do absolutely believe that the Dow House years uh, see some kind of transformation in his ability to process marriage. Um, but I, I did just feel like this play was very much about a man sort of in, you know, the problem with the marriage really when it boil it, when you boil it right down is that he was so caught up in this idea of the artist in his romantic solitude that in a sense, he, he wanted to be married but he couldn't be married. He couldn't allow her into his worldview. And, and I, I do feel that there's a kind of solipsism in this play. 
and that there's a way in which he's just looking at a series of mirrors of himself and and therefore and therefore i think fundamentally it's not a very good play because i do think plays are always about otherness and are always about you know one voice talking to another instead of one voice talking to itself and so and you know there are charming anecdotes about agnes uh being in the uh the theater at the time when it was rehearsed and 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 the actors observing O'Neill and Agnes kind of quarreling about this play out there. They didn't know exactly what was being discussed, but um, but Agnes, who who was also a writer, um, I think was seeing something of the limitations of this. And you know, just incidentally, I think it's pertinent because. Uh, Dean and, and Bonnie, I've seen your work in the past, and I, I really admire, it, especially Dean, that that Beyond the Horizon. It's so important to me. Um, but um, uh, and and the man, I've not seen you before, but I, I admire the work you put into this this project. <clears throat> but I do think that um, um, there's a, a kind of um, broken way that. Um, that his plays come across to us at this time, and and I am really appreciate Eric's effort to sort of say, well, let's let's do the psychoanalysis of this. Let's go into it. Let's try to figure out what is the neurosis at the basis of this play, and is there some way in which we can get a little less misery out of it than 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 is brought in with it, um, and. So I, I appreciate that very much, and um, and that's I guess that's my two cents about this. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, uh, Beth. Are we are, are we good? Okay. Well, anyway, um, um, I want to just thank everyone for joining us this last hour, and um, uh, yeah, just uh, appreciate anything. Actually, one more. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, like, this is like a really astute comment to end the conversation. Um, the problem in Welded, especially in comparison to the Dow House plays, is that nobody drinks. So that's um, from Steve Bloom. I just want, you know, brilliant. Thank you, Steve. Yes. <laughs> and I agree. <laughs> um, okay, great. Great. I'm going to go drink now. Um, <laughs> But anyway, uh, thank you guys. Uh, I want a special thanks to, 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 to Beth and, and all of our actors. Thank you for joining us uh, this past hour and, and all of you uh, who uh, hopefully uh, engage this play on one, one way or another and at least, uh, you know, had something new to think about. Uh, and uh, and I, I appreciate um, supporting our online efforts. I, I hope to continue to, to bring uh, online programming along with our our live programming, um, like uh, uh, Anna Christie <clears throat> this fall uh, at Dow House. Um, anyway, thank you all very much for joining us and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.